Okay, before we start, is there any questions uh, from last class about anything logistical or about the lecture itself? Okay, so just by way of review, um, we uh, started talking about evaluation methodologies. Uh, we're going to kick it off with some high-level methodologies, uh, and then later in the course we'll, we'll go into more specific uh, kinds of topics. So a high-level methodology, um, uh, there's three that we're going to look at. So last class we looked at Stride. That's just a mnemonic. It helps you brainstorm maybe ideas about uh, different attacks or uh, things, security properties you can think about uh, for your system. Um, it is uh, used to evaluate usually a single solution. So you, someone hands you something, asks you, is it secure or not? You're going to use Stride or something like Stride. Okay. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is called evaluation frameworks, and it's actually for comparing. So it would be like, here's 10 things, choose the best of the 10. Okay, so it's slightly different in terms of focus. Next class, uh, for the next little while, we'll talk about attack trees. Attack trees go back to s studying a single thing, but they go even narrower and they study one property of one system. Okay, so attack trees is sort of the narrowest, it's one property of one system. Stride is like one system, and then evaluation frameworks are for multiple systems. Okay, so for evaluation frameworks, we'll go through one example. Uh, it's an example that we all know uh, because it's based on something you, you already use and, and, and have used lots of times. Um, and then for your assignment, uh, you'll be given a new scenario and asked to apply evaluation framework, as well as a little bit of stride as well uh, for the first assignment. So the assignment is online. You can, you can look at it at any time, but uh, it will make maybe a little more sense uh, once we get through today's lecture. Okay, so the main thing about uh, evaluation frameworks uh, that it, it's meant to showcase is, um, well, the saying that economists sometimes say, there's no solutions, only trade-offs, meaning that uh, there's no, if I give you 10 options, there's no one option that's actually the best, okay? It depends on what you want. It depends what your priorities are, okay? So you might prioritize one kind of thing, then you might go with one solution. And if you prioritize something else, you might go for a different type of solution, okay? So sometimes there are clear winners, okay? So for example, let's say you're trying to decide what Wi-Fi security protocol you should use, and you can use WEP or WPA1 or WPA2 or WPA3. You should use WPA3. It's better, strictly better than two, which is strictly better than one, which is strictly better than WEP. Okay, no question. Unless if there's some compatibility issue, there's almost no reason not to use the latest protocol. Okay, so some things work like that where, you know, there's versions and the versions are strictly better than the older versions. Okay, but there's other types of things like what should you do to protect your computer? Should you use a firewall or antivirus or like, like, but they're competing solutions. Okay, and so that's where an evaluation framework is going to help you. It's going to help you with uh, competing uh, competing solutions. Uh, the deliverable of an evaluation framework is so simple that you've already seen it. Okay, you see it when you go to, um, I don't know, let's say you're looking at like buying furniture or a car or something like that and it'll say here's your three options, right, and then there'll be a set of properties and then there'll be like say a dot and like some of them will have the dot and other ones will not have the dot. Like you're buying a new computer, it's like, I want an SSD hard drive, here's the three models, this one has it and these two don't, okay? That's all we're trying to do with an evaluation framework, okay? We're trying to give something that's really easy to read, it's easy for the person to look at, it's just going to be a chart where you have your, your rows, in this case will be your different alternatives, you're going to have some columns about some properties that you want, and then the, the alternatives will either get the dot or they won't get the dot, okay? So it's really easy. Now, the hard part is coming up with the columns. What are the properties that you want? And it looks easy when it's done right, because you look at it and say it couldn't be done any different. 
yeah, they got all the properties, okay? But when you're sitting there trying to brainstorm what the properties are, which you'll be doing in your assignment, you'll realize it's a lot harder to come up with these things than it seems, okay? So it looks simple, but it it's, uh, doesn't mean it's simple to do. Okay, so these are kind of like evaluation frameworks uh, where, where basically you, you have some alternatives and then you have some information to distinguish them. Uh, for the course, for the sake of this lecture, for the course, uh, we're just going to do something kind of like the middle one, like the bank uh, checking account one, where it's just like there's dots or no dots, okay? Some of them have like different numbers and things like that. We're not even going to go into that level of detail, okay? We're just going to keep things really, uh, really simple. Okay, uh, the big point of an evaluation framework is it should be neutral. So unlike those other things that are probably trying to sell you something, right? Like if, if a car manufacturer gives you a chart like that, they're going to make their car look the best. How do they do that? Well, they tweak the rows. So whatever is good about their car, they're going to put them at the top of the list. And whatever is bad about their car, they're going to hide it or bury it or maybe not even have a row that addresses it. Okay, so those rows might not actually correspond to what you actually want. Your job with an evaluation framework is to try and do, do it right, okay? Do it in a fair way, a neutral way uh, that's able to, to, to compare uh, these things. Okay, now the next thing about an evaluation framework is, and this is a big emphasis of this course writ large, uh, is the idea that there's more to security than security, okay? So I give you something, and it might be the most secure thing. Someone said this last class, if a human can't use it, it doesn't matter how secure it is, right? No one's going to use it. They're going to use it wrong. They're going to avoid using it. You're not actually getting the security benefit unless if someone can use it, okay? If I give you something and it costs a million dollars for each of you, right, is that a good security solution? No, like you're not going to be able to afford it, right? Uh, probably, I don't, I don't know your circumstances, I can't afford it. Um, okay, so you have to think about costs, you know, that, that's important, right? And so what we do in evaluation framework is we look at security, okay, so it's in there, but we try to also look at uh, things like deployability, uh, which would be like cost, uh, who has to change how they do things, you have to change every computer in the world to make something work, like what, how, how do you actually roll it out? Okay, what are, what are the frictions or the road bumps to, to, to rolling it out? And then we look at usability, right? Can humans actually use it? And you can go beyond these three categories, but these three categories seem to work pretty well for most things in security. We sometimes call it the UDS framework for usability, deployability, security. And there's lots of academic papers that just use things in these three uh, categories and, and it seems to do a pretty good job, okay? Doesn't mean that, that you, you're stuck you have to do it this way. It's just, it's, it's a way of doing it that's sensible and has been done in practice. Okay, so we're going to build a table like those, like car comparison or checking account comparison things. Uh, so it doesn't matter how we do it, it's sort of arbitrary, but we'll make the solutions as the rows to the table. Okay. Um, generally, an evaluation framework is good when there are actually alternatives that you're comparing. Okay, so an alternative is you could do A or you could do B. You could do X, you could do Y, okay? Now, sometimes you're like, well, you could do X and you could do Y, okay? Then evaluation frameworks, they're not terrible for that, but you have to start thinking about, okay, if I combine rows and there's a dot on this row and a dot on this, then what happens like when you do both, right? Um, so, so anyways, you, you have to have some logic for like what it means to combine rows. So it's better for alternatives. Uh, the other thing that it's not great for, it's sort of a pointless exercise, is like the Wi-Fi versions where one is strictly better than the other, okay? If one's strictly better than the other, then there's nothing really to compare, okay? So this really works well where there is no clear winner. Uh, and you want to show someone all of the different trade-offs so that they can decide for themselves. And what they decide for themselves is might be different than what other people decide, okay? And so a good place where an evaluation framework is useful for, so I'm going to tease the idea, is think about something where there's actually no consensus, 
Okay, so sometimes in security there are problems and there's 10 different ways to solve them and it's been 20 years and we still have all 10 of those ways. Some people are doing one thing, some people are doing another thing and there's no consensus on it and that, that's like, that's an exact kind of problem where this, this is very useful, at least to study why and try and understand, okay? So I'll, I'll give you an example of that uh, in a, sec a few slides. Okay, so, so not versions, usually I always prefer version two over version one. Um, and then the other thing is to make sure that they, they actually are the same kind of thing. They're trying to solve the same thing, okay? You're not comparing like slightly different solutions that are trying to do different things, okay? So there are actually two different solutions to the exact same problem, more or less, okay? Um, all right, now the next thing that's, that's a, uh, this makes it a lot easier to present it and think about it. And if you did it in an academic setting, you'd want to do this. Um, it's better to compare s uh, sort of categories of solutions rather than a specific brand, okay? So like, for example, in terms of cars, uh, you might say, okay, what's the comparison between an electric vehicle, a gas vehicle, and a hybrid, okay? You can do that. Now, the alternative would be you could pick one electric, vehicle, like I'm specifically comparing the Tesla Model C to the Toyota Prius to the Volkswagen Golf, okay? Now, if you do the three brands, you're going to end up with all sorts of weird comparisons, like does it have CarPlay or does it, you know, does it come in five colors or seven colors? And those things don't really matter, okay? But if you compare categories, right, so if I just say it's an electric vehicle, you're going to focus on things like charging it and distance and mileage and price to operate and things like that. And you're not going to get hung up on like how many colors it comes in and things like that. Okay. So students sometimes do evaluation frameworks for projects. That's the other place where it shows up. And sometimes they do brands. Okay. And it, it doesn't work very well. And you, you end up comparing the wrong things. Okay. So try and distill the idea, like what's the core idea rather than the specific brand. Okay, now sometimes you get in trouble because an electric vehicle might work five different ways and without saying which of the five ways it, it works, you can't evaluate it, okay? But that you can solve, instead of jumping back to brands, you just solve it by saying, okay, electric vehicle with this and electric vehicle with this. So you, you can have three or four versions of an electric vehicle that you're comparing uh, to them, okay? Sometimes we get brands as an example so we're just like, okay, this is the category, and then here's an example of the brand, but we're not specifically comparing that particular brand. Okay, so that's more or less it for the rows. The rows are, are pretty easy. Uh, now the columns are like the properties that, that you're going to compare them based on, okay? And I'll say it again, it's harder than it looks. It looks easy, once, it, once it's done, it looks easy like that, it looks like it was obvious. But until you struggle through them, uh, you, don't, you don't realize how hard it is. Um, it takes some iterations. So sometimes you write down three properties, and then when you evaluate it, you notice that, oh, every time you get a dot on property one, you also get it on property two and property three. And then you realize that, oh, actually, at the end of the day, these are all the same thing. They're just different ways of saying basically the same thing, okay? Or sometimes you get the exact opposite. It's like, if you get the dot on one property, you never get the dot on property two and vice versa. And then you realize, oh, I, I actually have the same thing. It's just one is sort of the positive version of it and the other is the negative version of it. Okay. So you want to eliminate those kinds of redundancies. Okay. So you want to have, you know, properties that are independent. They're measuring totally different things uh, about the system. So they should all look uh, more or less different. And uh, it takes some work. You know, you might make adjustments to the properties or you might break the properties into smaller sub properties or you might join sub properties into a, a, a bigger property so you go back and forth with it the next thing you want to do is this just will make the chart uh easy to read is sometimes there's two ways of phrasing a property what we say positively or negatively right so let's take cost Right, so imagine in your head like $10 is sort of the threshold, okay? I could say this system costs more than $10. So you get the dot if it costs more than 
okay? Or I can say this system costs less than $10. Then you get the dot if it costs less than $10, okay? Generally, when I look at one of these charts, the more dots I see, the better, okay? So in other words, you should always phrase it in such a way that you want the dot. So the dot is the right thing, like you, you want the dot. So I would say it costs less than $10 because that's what you want. You want it to be cheap, okay? Uh, if you say it costs more than $10 and that's your column, it's still correct and you're still assigning the dots correctly, but now it's bad to get a dot, right? I don't, I don't want the dot in that case, okay? So we always try to phrase it in such a way, it's just a matter of English, like you just flip around the, basically what you're saying uh, and you always make it so that, that, that the dot is what you want. Okay, then when you look at the chart, you don't have to think about, oh, is, is this a good dot or a bad dot? All, all dots are good dots, okay? More dots you get, the better it is generally. This, this will make a little more sense too when we, we go through an example itself. So for example, I might say like, um, the system is resilient to this particular attack, right? That's, that's a good thing, you want that, you wanna be resilient. As opposed to saying, oh, it's vulnerable to this attack. Vulnerable to attack A, vulnerable to attack B. Now the dots, you don't want the dot. If you have the dot, then it's a bad thing, right? So it's confusing to read because then you have to think about whether the dots are, are good or bad, okay? So all dots should be good dots. Then what you do, uh, so, so we saw some examples like just briefly, like some, sometimes these charts would have numbers or like specific things. Uh, just to keep it simple for the sake of this course for the project, well, you can do whatever you want for the project, but for the assignment and the, uh, the example we'll do in class, uh, we'll just keep it to like dot or no dot. And then sometimes you kind of feel like it should get half a dot, like it, it's sort of halfway there. It does something about this property. It's not fully sufficient, but it's better than doing nothing at all. <laughs> then you can try and introduce a half dot, okay? Half dots are optional. You don't have to do, if you can do everything with either yes, no, uh, then that's great. Uh, but sometimes you feel, you'll see some examples where it feels like you should be getting like a half dot. Now you can do like a quarter dot and three quarter dots and things like that. Or you can do a, a number between one and 10. Like there's different ways of doing it. But this seems to be like a pretty good balance of like, it's still really easy to, to read. And you can just sort of glance at it, even if you don't like think about what all the properties mean, you can sort of visually get a feel for like what's better than what else. And it still gives you like a lot of information, okay? Uh, it's still a lot of work just having three levels uh, for, for each kind of property. Now, one thing you do need to do, and it's a bit tedious when you write these things up, so this is important for your assignment, is you're going to find every column and you're going to say, okay, this is what the column means, okay? Then you have to say, what does it mean to get a full dot for this column, okay? What does it mean to get a half dot for this column? What does it mean to get no dot for this column? And you're going to have to do that for every column because for each column, it might be different, right? One's about cost, one's about usability, one's about security. So like what, what they mean is, is dependent on the column itself. Okay, so you have to go through column by column and, and just say, this is exactly what it means. And, you, and notice you're doing this before you even see the rows, okay? So it has nothing to do with what the rows are. It's just, although knowing what the rows are and how you're going to evaluate will help you pick the levels, but this levels are just independent. It's just sort of like, this is what a full dot means for this property, okay? Okay, questions so far? All right, so this will hopefully become clearer when we see an example, all right? So the example I wanna do is, I said a good, a good thing for evaluation frameworks is, what's something where there's 10 different ways of doing it and uh, there's, there's no consensus about it, okay? Even though it's been 15, 20 years. One really good example of that is passwords. We all know passwords, okay? Uh, does every website just use a password now? Username, password, that's it, nothing else. Okay, so what are some alternatives? Okay, so one-time fact, or two-factor authentication, one-time password, something like text to you, that kind of thing. Sure, anything else? 
Uh, say everyone's talking at once. Okay. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, resetting a password is slightly different. So security questions and things like that tend to come up when you want to reset. So I'm going to narrow our focus just to the authentication itself, but studying resets is also interesting as well. And you can usually break it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, let me do biometrics first. I heard that. So biometrics, what are some biometrics that you use? Fingerprint, face recognition, uh, so phones and things like that have it. Uh, sorry, what was the other one? Okay, so like, a, has anyone seen an RSA token? Uh, it's like a, a little key fob, uh, it has a number on it. It's kind of like the one-time fa factor that you get, except for it's like a hardware uh, kind of thing. Okay, and do, now that we have two-factor authentication, does everyone use it? No, like there's still biometrics, there's still other kinds of things that people use, right? We have RSA tokens, we've had them for 20 years. Does ever, do, do you all use RSA tokens all the time now? No, but does that mean no one uses them? Okay, so what we're seeing is an example of this. There's no solution, there's just trade-offs. Some people use RSA tokens, maybe high security, like you work in the military or something like that. At Concordia, we just moved to two-factor authentications for many things. Right, so that was a solution they chose. Uh, you download a game on your phone. Are you going to create a new password and, and a new account just to play that game? Probably not. Do they still want to log in? Yeah, they want to track you. So what do they do? They make you log in through your Facebook account or your Google account or your Apple account that you already have, right? So that, that's another solution, right? And so anyway, so the point is there's, there's a lot of these different solutions. There's no clear winner. And so that's where an evaluation framework works okay so that's the example that we'll do so we'll go through uh, different password uh, uh, alternatives and then we'll think about what the properties are and we'll, we'll try and compare them before I do that though I uh, I just want to say a little bit about how passwords work because it becomes a little bit relevant when we think about uh, what security properties uh, password should have okay so this is sort of a simplification of, of kind of what happens on uh, the back end uh, if you go to a website and you uh, create a, a username and password, okay? So what happens is you go, you say, I want a new account. The website says, great. Uh, it says, what's your username? You might choose it, it might assign it to you. It says, what's your password, okay? You send it across. Uh, later, in a couple lectures, you're gonna learn that this channel that you send it over is secure. Okay, so this is an encrypted channel, so anyone in the middle uh, can't intercept it, or they can intercept it, but it just looks like noise uh, because it's encrypted. We'll go through all the, all the details of, of that. Then what the server does, this is, by the way, this is how it worked maybe in the 1980s. Okay, so we're, we're going to talk about how to make it better. But this, this would be a bad design today, but it's the easiest design, and then we'll work our way up to what actually is done. So the server, do they have to know what, do they have to remember your password? It's kind of a simple question. Okay, so some say yes, some say no. Think about the reason. If you are thinking yes, what's the reason? If you're thinking no, what's the reason? Shout it out really loud. Okay, so they have a database. Why do they have to know your password? Why do they have to store it in the database? Okay, you come back tomorrow, they have to know whether it's you. Whether it's you is whether you know the same password, so they have to know what your password is, otherwise they have nothing to compare it to, okay? So the server has to store your password or, or something about your password at least, okay? So they'll have a big password database, they'll have lots of users, lots of passwords. You come back tomorrow, you say, hi, I'm Alice, and they'll say, okay, yeah, I see that you have a password, what is it? You send your password and then they'll uh, compare it. Okay, now what can go wrong uh, with, with passwords, okay, uh, from a security perspective? So this process can basically be attacked at three different locations. It can be attacked sort of where the user is, you can look at the channel, or you can look at the server side, okay? So on the user side, uh, you have things like uh, shoulder surfing, so that would be someone that's standing behind you, uh, they're watching you uh, type it in. Uh, it could be, you know, so basically it goes from the human itself to like from their brain to their fingers and their fingers are typing on the keyboard, 
Okay, so it is possible before it even gets entered into the keyboard, it is possible to observe it uh, just by looking over their shoulder. Okay, so you can think of that as sh shoulder, uh, shoulder surfing. Now this is where I would like to show you a movie clip, uh, but I can't do it because I just have the PDF on this computer because the HDMI isn't working. But for the people watching on YouTube, you are watching the movie clip. But anyways, there, there's a little thumbnail there. Uh, it's kind of a funny scene uh, that happened in real life. So there's a whistleblower named Edward Snowden, and uh, he worked for the NSA, and he leaked a bunch of information about what the NSA was doing. He felt that it was ethical to, to, to leak it. Uh, and so uh, some journalists meet him. They end up meeting in Hong Kong. It's very secretive. And uh, he's going to show them some documents on his computer. And so he wants to log in. And so you can see it looks kind of like a red ghost. What he did is he actually took the blanket from his bed and he put it over himself and his computer. He typed his password in and then he pulled the blanket off and then showed them the actual documents itself because he says, you know, you never know where there's a camera. There could be a hidden camera anywhere, and it could see me like log in and, and, and learn my password. Okay, so that's an extreme probably for most of us. You know, we're not doing like life and death espionage. Um, that would be an extreme thing to do to, to try and counter it, but it is a threat. Okay, and then you can start thinking like I type a password in, that's fine. What about a biometric? Well, there's nothing to see. You can watch me put my finger on my phone, but you can't. You know, you can be watching over my shoulder, okay? So not all of these solutions are going to evaluate the same on are they secure against so shoulder surfing or not. Uh, another thing is uh, once it goes from the keyboard, it goes into the computer, you know, it goes through the operating system, eventually coughs up to the browser, and then the browser packages it up, it kind of goes back down the operating system and then sends it across the wire. So in that whole technology stack, right, when it's, in Alice's computer, uh, you can there can be observation within the computer itself. Okay, uh, so malware, uh, for example, uh, malware that's that's grabbing it at any point in that stack uh, could report it home. It could be as simple as as you're on a bad website with some bad JavaScript, and it's every time you type a key, and it's like phoning home with it. So it can be anywhere between the keyboard uh, and the um, and the uh, uh, the website itself. Uh, one example uh, from Concordia is a few years ago, 2016 actually, a long time ago, um, some people were walking around the library and they noticed that uh, when these physical keyboards are plugged into the computer, there was like a little dongle that was between the USB and the uh, actual computer itself. Uh, and so that dongle was recording every keystroke off the keyboard it was storing on the dongle, or it was maybe emailing it, I forget. You can put a little Wi-Fi card in these things here. Um, and uh, yeah, and so someone just comes, they, they plug it in, plug the keyboard in, they walk away, right? And then all, everything, well, it's actually everything that's typed, right? But it's easy to parse out the passwords because it's usually the first thing someone, so you'll see a delay in time and then it's like almost the first thing, or you see someone type in like a username and then a password, it's usually easy to parse it out. Maybe. There's no Wi-Fi on it, but then later you come back a month later, you just grab it and go, and then now you you have it and it's all stored on on the dongle itself. Okay, so like this stuff is very easy uh, to do. Uh, it's hard to detect, right? Um, and so yeah. So anyway, so that's that's an example. Uh, so you can have malware uh, anywhere in that kind of stack. You can have an adversary that's sitting on the wire, so they're gonna watch uh, your password go across the wire, and then they're gonna try and nab it. This is the one attack that more or less doesn't work, okay? It doesn't work because we have this thing called HTTPS, and you're gonna know in four or five weeks, you're gonna know way more about HTTPS than you ever wanna know. Uh, I promise you that, because uh, we're gonna spend three lectures on it, but, um, and, and it's not actually as secure as it's made out to be, but anyways, if it works as it should work, then everything's encrypted and it's, it's actually designed because you can't connect direct, my computer isn't like directly connected to every server in the world. Like I have to go through middle parties and they can all be listening and we know nation states listen on, on that type of stuff. And so we need this, what's called end-to-end -end encryption uh, between all, all the way across the wire. 
And then uh, the adversary can go after the, the server itself. Okay, so let's say you're able to breach uh, the server. Then if you just have every username and password that's sitting there, you get them all. Okay, and you see that you read about it in the news, you know, websites got hacked and their passwords got dumped. And there's websites where you can check whether your passwords have got been leaked. Apple now does it like I use Apple's key uh, manager, password manager, and it uh, tells me like, oh, you should change the password on this site because it's been seen in, in one of these leaks. Um, and so, yeah, so the whole thing gets dumped. And then believe it or not, it's true. Some people do actually use the same password on one site that gets hacked on a different site. And so you could log in to another site because you have the username and password on one site. Okay, so it does happen. I've heard about it happening. Of course, I set, you know, pure random, 100 character passwords for every single website that are memorized in my head, and I have 600 of them up there, and I never forget them and I never type them in wrong. Uh, but other people, this this could be a problem. Now, this we can do something about a little bit. We can apply a little bit of cryptography that will help. It won't completely solve the problem, but it will at least frustrate the adversary and make them uh, their job a little bit more difficult. Um, so the first thing we can do is instead of storing the password raw, uh, we can store them in what's called a hash. You'll learn about hashes in 6110. Uh, but hashes are basically kind of like a one-way function. It kind of scrambles things up and then you can't go backwards, okay? So now we should stop and think, well, if the passwords are all scrambled up, then when Alice comes back and says, this is my password, how do you know whether it's right or not if, if it's all scrambled up? But because it works in one direction, what you do is they come to you, they say, this is my password. You put it through the same process that you did with when, when you stored it in the first time. And so these are deterministic, meaning the same input gives you the same output, okay? So if Alice registers one password and you store it, the hash of it, and then she comes back later and gives you the same password, when you hash it, it should come out to the same results, if it's the same. And they're also very sensitive. So even a single bit that's slightly different will result in a completely different hash. And it's hard to even find two things that hash to the same output, okay? If you could do that, like just find one pair of messages out of any message possible, if you could find one pair of messages that hash, that produce the same hash for like a, a modern hash function like SHA-3, uh, then I'll give you an A+. Plus. Okay, that's your project. Just tell me the two, the two messages and then that's fine. In fact, you'll get an A plus in 6110 even though I don't teach it. Okay, I'll go to bat for you and give you an A plus there. Okay, and you can write some papers and you might win a Turing Award or something like that. Okay, so it's, it's really hard to do. Uh, people have done it on hash functions from like the 80s, but uh, they, they, it, you can't, no one knows how to do it on, on modern hash functions. Okay, now, uh, it's, are we done? Okay, so the hash function is, is, is pretty good. Now, there's one problem with a hash function which actually comes from this fact that they're one way and deterministic, okay? What happens is, let's say I break into the server, I steal the password file, I'm sitting there and because it's one way, I don't know what Alice's password is, okay? I can't go backwards. I can't start with the hash output and figure out what the input string was that generated that output, okay? So that's off the table, okay? But can I really do nothing? Well, one thing I can do is, let's say I have a guess, okay? If I have a guess at what her password is, I can try my guess and hash it and if it comes out to the same thing, I found it. If it doesn't, then I can at least eliminate that guess, okay? So what I could do is I could just guess lots of different passwords, and there's automated tools like John, Johnny the Ripper and things like that that will do this for you. Uh, and so it will, yeah, it's a great name. And then it will, um, anyways, it will, it will generate all of these things. Now, the second thing is, let's say everyone in the world does these hash databases. They all use the modern, hash function, which is SHA-3, okay? What, I, what you have to do is, if I wanna break one website, I can try all the guesses, like I can put a whole dictionary plus all the variations of the dictionary. I can substitute every E for the number three because people like to do that. Like, I can, I can do this as fast as my computer can do it. I can build a giant table of guesses and what the hashes result of that is. I'll sort it by the, the output of the hash, right? 
then you, you don't have to do the work itself. You're just like, I just stole a password database from a website. I see they're using SHA-3. Someone already tried every password conceivable for SHA-3. I can just download it as a table and then I can just look up whether my hashes are there or not, okay? So this is called a rainbow table. So someone, one person does it for that hash function and then they just share it with everyone else. And then if you get uh, your own password database that use that same hash function, uh, then you don't have to do the work of hashing it yourself. So it saves a lot of work. Okay, uh, so rainbow tables are still a threat. How do you combat a rainbow table? Well, what you, what you actually want to do is you want, to, you want every website to use a different hash function. Even better, every user, every password in your table on every website should use its own, pass, its own hash function. Okay, so when I store David, I use one hash function. When I store Alice, I use a different hash function. And every other site is using a different hash function. The problem is there aren't that many hash functions. Okay, now the nice thing about hash functions are if you take the thing you want to hash and put a random number beside it, that's kind of like a unique hash. Okay, if I change that random number, right, then I, I'll get a different answer. Okay, so we do that, we call it salt. Uh, so we, we take the password, we just pick a random number, we store that random number in the table. Okay, so now the table, I, I should have shown it, I didn't, but now it would say David, here's the hash of his password, and here's the salt value that I use. So it's not a secret, it's not a key, okay? But it's something that just makes the hash unique. So if somebody else built a rainbow table with a different salt, you can't use it, okay? You have to build the rainbow table from scratch for your salt value. So every salt value basically results in a different rainbow table, that makes sense? Um, okay, another thing you can do to frustrate people is try to make the hash not so fast. You can try and slow it down, okay? Now, if you slow it down, it hurts everybody. So it's going to hurt Alice when she goes to log in because now the server has to do a slow hash. So the easiest way to slow a hash down is just do it a thousand times. So hash it, take the output, hash it again, take the output, hash it again, stop after a thousand, okay? Um, so it slows the server down. Okay, but the server is only doing it once, right? You send one password, it does it once, it's slow, it's annoying, but, it, but then it's either the right password or not and it makes a decision. An adversary is trying every single word in a dictionary. They're doing it, you know, billions and billions of time. It's going to be really annoying for them, okay? So it does hurt the server because it slows everything down for the server, but it really hurts the adversary because they're trying so many uh, different combinations. And so it's thought that it's better to, to really hurt the adversary than, you know, and, and tolerate it uh, for a server. Um, so this is what a modern, this is what would be stored in a password database on a modern website. This again is simplified. There's actual protocols that are a little bit more involved, but the principles are, there's some salt value to make this unique so that you can't build a rainbow table unless if you built it for that specific salt value. And uh, you iterate it a thousand times to slow it down. Okay. All right, so let's, is there any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, it can't exactly, so, okay, so let's, well, let's just think about it. So you are slowing it down for the server. Now to denial of service it, I would have to ask for it a lot of times, okay? So that's what I would do. I would sit there and send wrong passwords as fast as I can. It would slow it down. But what a website would do before they would, uh, they would try and process them all is they would probably just block your account. Like they would say, okay, you've tried three times, uh, that's it. You're, you're done, or we're going to block your IP address. So, sorry? If we have reflectors. Yeah, so if you have reflectors and botnets and things like that, then they're going to have to block them one by one. And so it's, you are going to grief them uh, a bit, uh, but eventually they'll block everything you have. Um, so, yeah. Does it, uh, we are doing thousand times as is called hourglass, which is slow down the hash function. Yeah, so the, the thousand slows down the hash function. Um, so it's called uh, uh, P, 
PBKDF2 is the main center, password-based key derivation function 2. Uh, 1,000 is actually more or less the right number. They usually choose powers of 2, so it might be 1,024, uh, which is the closest power of 2, but that's for, like, crypto reasons. Uh, but, but usually that's kind of considered a, a good amount. So you wouldn't see 10,000, you wouldn't see 100. You probably see a number around that. Yeah. But that's, like, sort of an art and not a science, like, what that number should be. Okay, uh, another thing I should say is there, there actually are better things you can do than hash it a thousand times. One thing about hashing a thousand times is your hash function consumes a certain amount of memory and because you're always taking the input, the output from the previous round and feeding it in as the input, whatever memory you need to, to hash something, that's as, mu as much as you consume. So it, it's computationally slow, but it's not, it doesn't consume any more memory than hashing it once. Okay. What some people will do is they'll take it and they'll blow it up, like they'll expand it so it consumes a whole bunch of memory, and then they'll make you do a lot of computation on top of it. And the idea is that memory is like kind of harder to, to, to replicate as an adversary trying to crack it uh, than, than computation. So these are called memory hard problems. So bcrypt uh, is, is an example that, that is both uh, uh, time hard and memory hard. So anyway, so this is, this is just to give you the principle, but in practice, there's, there's a bunch of things. There was even a competition a few years ago to, to de develop uh, these memory hard functions, and they picked a winner, and I, I didn't really follow the, uh, like the result of that, but you can look that up if you're interested. Okay. All right, so that, that was just a sort of backgrounder on uh, passwords. It's going to help us think about security properties that we want. So let's go back to the evaluation framework, okay? So we need some columns, we need some rows. Let's start with the rows. So the rows are uh, alternatives to passwords. We need alternatives because no one can memorize a strong password for every website that you use, okay? So you gotta do something different, all right? Uh, so what are the alternatives? So what I recall, uh, people said two-factor authentication. Uh, we said biometrics. Uh, what else did we say? Okay, same thing. Uh, oh, yeah, to tokens, sorry, yeah. RSA tokens, yeah. Authentication keys? Uh, yeah, okay, so another thing would be like some sort of uh, cryptographic key that you store on your computer. Okay, so we ca sometimes call them certificates. Uh, the biggest example would be SSH. Uh, so that's something that uses something, it's, it's too big to memorize, it's like a password, it's just bigger, so it's called a key, it's on your computer somewhere, so that's one. Um, okay, with phones, I, uh, so I can look at it or use my fingerprint, but let's say I want to type a password in to, uh, to open my phone, how do I, on an Android for example, how do I input the password? Do I type it with a keyboard? Okay, so I usually swipe, right? It gives me like sort of a graphical layout. So there's a bunch of work on what are called graphical passwords. And the, the idea behind it is that they're easier to memorize because it's sort of like a graphical pattern. Uh, like it might show you a picture and you click on a bunch of points in the picture and that's your password, okay? So that's another thing, but the, the swipe pattern on Android's the, the biggest example of a, um, of a graphical password. Uh, what else? Uh, so I mentioned one, I use a password manager, okay? So I get, I actually, I actually get very close to the ideal, which is I do have a very strong random password for every single website. The only thing is I don't keep it in my brain, I keep it in a file on my computer, okay? And maybe I synchronize it to the cloud so it's, it's available on, on all my devices. Uh, anyone can think of anything else quick? Okay, so I think we did pretty good. Is it physical, like pen drive? Yeah, yeah, so they're, they're, okay, so you could have like a literal key, so that is a kind of authentication based on something you have. So the certificate would be very close to it. It's a digital key, if you will, uh, that, that you have. And then there are some like weird paper-based things, like you have like grids and you like, anyways, I've seen some paper-based tokens and things like that that are, are physical. So I, I don't have that in the slides, but uh, later I'll show you an academic paper that has some of that stuff. So. 
as well. OK, uh, so two-factor authentication uh, we've seen. Uh, so graphical passwords would be like a swipe pattern on Android. Uh, biometrics, so face, iris, uh, fingerprint, those are the big three. Uh, cryptographic key, so I store it, SSH, it's a file, it's on my computer. Uh, the, the nice thing is I don't have to type anything in. I just say connect. My computer goes and finds it, it sends it does its crypto, and if the server is happy, then I'm connected. I don't even know what happens. It happens so fast that I don't, I don't even notice it. Uh, password manager, so this is what I use. Uh, so you can think of it as, as having a master password. We'll evaluate it in terms of, of having a master password, and we'll evaluate it in terms of it not being synchronized on the cloud. Uh, so what that means is it is a file on your computer. It's only on your computer. If you sit down on a new computer, you don't have access to all of your passwords. It is protected by a master password, so if you sat down on my computer, you wouldn't be able to use it unless if you knew my master password. So basically, it kind of, instead of having to remember 100 passwords for 100 sites, I remember one password for 100 sites. Plus, I have to have the file, like the database, lying around. So that's sort of, that's how we'll think about it, even though there's different ways of thinking about it. Uh, so this is what uh, the, the tokens look like. So they're, they're very similar to the uh, getting a code over SMS. Uh, the only difference is that it's a physical device. Some of them you press a button to get a code. Sometimes they just are on a timer and so they update. How this works in more detail, we'll explore later. I'm going to tell you a story about these tokens when we talk about social engineering and how all of these tokens got broken. Um, and, and then I'll tell you a bit more about how they work. But for now, you can think of it as very close to a two-factor authentication. Uh, single sign-on is another one. So this is where you already have an account with Facebook, so just log in with Facebook, uh, and, and then you're done. And then other things that, that people mentioned that, that are relevant to passwords, but we're going to tr I'm going to try and narrow you just on like logging in. But things like security questions, verification questions, that's more of a resetting passwords. Uh, CAPTCHAs, also something you see at login time, but we're not going to, they're solving a different problem than are, are you who you say you are. Um, so we mentioned locking accounts, so sometimes if you try to log in too many times, you get locked out. Uh, Geolocation is another thing. Uh, so if I log in from an IP address that looks Maybe at the same time, I'm already logged in from an IP address in Montreal, but the IP's from somewhere else. Some servers will say, yeah, you got the password right, but it looks suspicious. So now we're, we're going to make you do extra authentication, maybe throw some security questions at you, uh, or we're just going to block it and then notify through email the account holder that, that it was blocked. And then they can click on the email and say it's actually me uh, if, if they want to. OK. Then what we need is uh, we need a set of, um, of columns. OK, so columns are going to be uh, broken. I mentioned uh, we'll, we'll use the, what's called the UDS framework, so usability, deployability, and security. Um, this comes from a paper uh, that's, that's actually on password. So the first paper that I saw that, that really tried to do this in a, an explicit way uh, was this paper. I'll show you their evaluation framework after uh, because it's interesting to see and it's, uh, um, it's a lot more involved than the kind of toy version that we'll make. Um, so the, the thing we do in class will be kind of a, a real toy version. Uh, this would be like what a true academic paper would look like. And then for a project assignment, you want to do something a little bit in between. You're not going to go as extreme as they will, uh, but you'll do something a little better than, than what we do in class. Okay, so, uh, oh, I, I might mention also that one of these co-authors is in Ottawa, uh, Paul Van Orschot. He was actually here, I had lunch with him today, uh, and he gave a talk on Wednesday, and if I had been thinking ahead, I would have advertised it on the Moodle, uh, but you might have got an email as a student uh, that he gave a seminar here. But. It's just for your interest. Okay. Um, okay, so usability, what does it mean? So basically, you think from the user's perspective, and you've got to think about what are all the problems that might make them not want to use the system. Okay? 
Uh, so basically, how easy is the system to use? So think of all those password alternatives. Biometrics, password manager, client-side certificates, you know, all those types of things. You guys know all of them. You probably use most of them. You might not have used an RSA token or maybe a, not a client-side certificate, but you've, you've used, I bet everyone in this room has used like six of them uh, before, okay? So is there any difference in usability? It, is there one in particular that you would think is really good or really bad? Yeah, yeah, so give me an example. Okay, so there you go. So you have to carry it around, okay? Uh, we'll visit that in deployability, but there's also a cost to it. So if, if Concordia said we're using RSA tokens from now on, they would have to go and buy them and they're $10 each or whatever. And when you have a million, or you don't, not a million students, but like 10,000 students or whatever, but it, it adds up, right? Um, but then you also have to carry it, okay? Then also, what else do you have to do? Let's think about you logging in. So I type my username in. I type my password in, then what do I have to do? All right, I have to dig it out of my pocket. I got to look at it. Then I have to type a six digit random number in and I'm looking at it. I make one mistake, what happens? It doesn't let me log in. Then I have to do everything again, right? And then I'm looking at it and it changes because it changes every, I don't know, minute or two minutes or whatever. And then I have to like delete it and like add it, like start again, right? So that those are usability issues, right? I have to type something in, it's extra. Uh, it's something to carry around. So that's bad, right? We should punish that, okay? So we're going to punish it. We're not going to give it a lot of dots on usability. Uh, what's a good one? What's, what's probably the, the quickest, easiest thing? Okay, so I would say either biometrics, pretty good, but they can be annoying too, right? You're outside, it's cold. I have like a scarf on and, you know, or in COVID I had a mask, you know, and, and it wouldn't unlock or... I had a fingerprint, I have to take my gloves off, you know, to, to, to do it. So it's way better than typing some RSA thing in. Still not maybe the best. Um, uh, the the client-side certificate's the easiest. You don't even know what's happening, right? It just, you tell it to log in and it logs you in. That's it, right? Um, so anyway, so you can start to see there are differences between them, right? Uh, Two-factor I find really annoying. I find Concordia's implementation of it super annoying. Uh, I was able to, um, uh, if I had my Apple on the screen, I would show you how you can make it a lot easier for yourself if you use their password manager because it can actually manage two-factor authentication. So now I just, I tap my fingerprint, it puts my password in, it asks me for my verification code, I tap my fingerprint, it puts it in. Anyways, I'll, uh, uh, I'll show that to you when, once the laptop is, is on the screen. Okay, what about deployability? Um, so deployability is thinking from the, like, let's say it's Concordia, they're trying to decide. Uh, so it's from their perspective, what are all their factors? So do I have to put up a new server? Do I have to get software installed on your computers in order to make this work? Do I, does it cost me money? Do I have to give you these things? Do I have to track, oh, this RSA token I gave to this person and this one I gave to this person and I have to have a big database of it. Uh, and then someone says I lost it and then I have to revoke their old one and give them a new one. You know, like these, these are sort of the, the deployability stuff. And then security is going to be, the main security thing is like, can someone guess your password, right? Uh, or, or whatever it is that you're using to log in. Right? That's why two-factor authentications are long random numbers is because it's adding kind of entropy and making it hard to guess, okay? So there's a bunch of guessing. Can people on your shoulder see your password and attack you that way? Uh, how resilient is it to malware? You can think about phishing. You think about privacy. Um, so, so anyway, so like for example, one biggest dis disadvantage period of single sign-on, you might think, oh, that's great, uh, you know, I want to access this website. I already have a Facebook account, so I'll just log in with Facebook, okay? So it's super simple from my perspective. Now, my question to you is why, why does Facebook do that? From a deployability standpoint, Facebook now has to actually take traffic from this other website. They have to set up a server. They, they have to, you know, you know it's, it's enough for them to manage people logging into their own website. Why do they want to be the login for a thousand other websites besides their own? and do it for free, right? They'll, they'll say, copy and paste this code into your website, you know, 
commit it, and now all of a sudden it just works, and all the infrastructure we're doing for free, right? Is it free? What's the, what's the benefit? Okay, every single time you log in, what time you log in, how many times you log in a day, Facebook gets. That's data. They like data. They like to monetize it. And so that's, that's the trade-off. So from a privacy perspective, it's, it's not great because um, uh, you're basically telling Facebook every single time you, you log into a website. Okay. Um, so, so anyway, so the next task that we'll save uh, for after the break is we'll, we'll actually try to write down some usability properties, some deployability properties, security properties, and then we'll go through the alternatives and we'll assign dots, okay? Uh, so let's go take a 10 minute break and then we'll, uh, we'll get back to it. Okay. So as you recall, uh, we need to come up with some columns. So we kind of talked at a high level what usability will be, what deployability will be, what security will be. So let's, uh, let's put concrete ones in. Okay, so here's a set of usability columns, uh, things that we could use. So again, when you look at it, it looks sort of obvious, but coming up with this list is, is a bit hard. Okay, nothing to memorize. Biometrics, do you have to memorize anything? Okay, so, uh, but, but a password you do, master password for a password manager, you have to memorize at least one thing. It's better than memorizing 100 things. Uh, easy to learn, uh, it's easy to use. You'd sort of have to define what easy means, but that's fine. Uh, nothing new to carry. Uh, so RSA tokens would be an example of something that would not get the dot in that case. Uh, there's some things that like might work if you have five passwords, like some new like way of memorizing them or something like that. But we want systems that now you you have a thousand passwords probably uh, across all the different websites, so it needs to scale. Uh, errors, so I'm I'm copying the SMS thing or the RSA token. SMS I can at least copy paste probably, uh, but it depends what if I'm on my computer and I'm on my phone or whatever. But RSA like I have to actually copy it visually, right? So I'm going to make mistakes. Uh, you can think about what happens when I lose the token. Can I recover that kind of thing? Uh, deployability. So how expensive is it per user? Uh, do we need new servers? Uh, do we need to change people's browsers and how they work? Um, th these are from the paper. Uh, so they also consider the maturity. So that would be uh, like this is something that's been around for 15 years, or this is something that someone invented last year. And so the preference would be for something that's been studied for 15 years rather than something that's new. Uh, open protocol is sort of how well does it, like, like how, uh, how well does it play with other people that want to play with it or, or change it or modify it, that, that kind of thing. So proprietary, and, and it also goes to security so you can study uh, open protocols better, so you might have a, a better feeling that they're they're more secure. The flip side of that is you might say, well, the adversary can study it as well, so they might be it might be easier for the the adversary to identify flaws. Whereas if it's like a secret inside a company how this thing works, then they would have to first you know break the secret. But I think the the lesson after like a couple decades of computer security is that open is is better. Uh, then in terms of security. Uh, we can think about, can I guess it? Uh, can I impersonate you? I know a lot about you. I know like your hobbies and what you like to do. Uh, is that an advantage to me or is it just not an advantage? Um, if I wanna try and watch you put your password in, uh, let's say I'm physically watching you, is that going to be an advantage? Let's say I'm watching you from within your computer, like I'm malware on your computer, is that going to be an advantage? Uh, we can think about phishing. Uh, we can think about theft, like is there something that I can steal? Uh, and then more on the privacy perspective, uh, we can think about uh, is there some sort of trusted third party that's involved? So a third party would be not me, not the website, someone else. So like Facebook, because they're, I'm doing Facebook Connect uh, would, would be an example of a trusted third party. Okay. 
So what we do is, I'm, I just picked a couple of these rows. It's too much to even go through all of them, but this I picked enough to, to give you a flavor of, of what it looks like, okay? So your first task is decide what your columns are, okay? So I'll do some of these, but not all of them. Uh, the next thing you wanna do is, before we even consider what the solutions are, like we're not yet worried about what are we gonna get biometrics? What are we gonna give two-factor authentication? We just have to say, where's, the goalposts for what a full dot means, what a half dot means, and what a no dot means, okay? So, easy to use or physically effortless, okay? Um, if I need to do something, like I need to, let's say, let's take it as typing it in, but I want to limit myself to typing because it could be drawing for a graphical password, it could be putting my finger on a fingerprint or something like that. Um, if I have to do something and I have to do it every time I log in, I log in a hundred times, I have to do that thing a hundred times, then I would say that's not very easy to use. Okay. Conversely, imagine I didn't have to do anything. Okay. I don't, I don't know if any of our systems meet that definition, but let's say I don't have to do anything. Okay. Then that's, that's great. Then I'll get a full dot on this. Then you might think about, well, maybe there's a middle ground. Like maybe I have to do something once, like unlock my password manager but then once it's unlocked then everything then it's like a full dot right so i do it once for and then i can log in a thousand times without having to do anything else so that would be like kind of a middle position so we might decide that a half knot is necessary okay now what you're going to do is you're not going to just do top to bottom like you'll put these dots in stone and then it will be like that. What you're going to do is you're going to try the dots this way, then you're going to go through your system, and then you're going to feel like these two systems are coming out the same, but I feel like there's a difference. Then you're going to go back here and tweak what the dot means, okay? So like this is sort of, that's what I mean by iterative. You're going to go back and forth a bit on settling in on, on your definitions, but I'm jumping all the way to the, to the finish line. Uh, so this is, is what we could use. Uh, memorize. So I tell you nothing to memorize. That sounds like a good property, right? So notice it's phrased positively. You want nothing to memorize. It's not, I have to memorize a lot. Um, so full dot would be like, there's literally nothing to memorize. I have to memorize zero things. Okay. Uh, no dot would be if I have a thousand accounts, I have to memorize a thousand things. Okay. So like traditional passwords. And then again, you could think, well, what about a password manager? There's that master password. So I have to know that. So I do have to memorize something. So it's not nothing to memorize. But at the same time, it's a lot better to memorize one password than a thousand, right? Like that's, it's clearly doing something about this memorization problem, okay? I can't give it the full dot. A half dot seems like, it doesn't seem good enough because it is actually making a meaningful contribution. So in this case, this is where a half dot might kick in, okay? Again, you don't have to use half dots. So it should be natural where you, you really feel like there, there is a sort of half solution to it. And you could argue that this is more like a three quarter dot or something like you're going from a thousand to one, like that's a huge reduction. Going from one to zero is a much smaller reduction, right? But, but anyways, we just use half and full and, and, and that type of thing. It's just make it, make it simple. There, I should mention there's no right or wrong way. So in the assignment, you're all going to do evaluation framework of the same thing but you're all going to have different columns. You're all going to tell, you're going to find your dots slightly differently. Like there's a lot of variation uh, in terms of, of what you can do. Uh, nothing to carry. So full dot would be, there's actually literally nothing to carry. Half dot, or sorry, no dot would be, you have to carry something, something new that you would normally carry. So like an RSA token. And then you could think about, well, like for two factor, I have to carry my phone around, right? So, but I'm also carrying it anyways, right? So it's sort of a burden because maybe I want to not carry my phone around, but at the same time, it's, it's not like the RSA token where it's like something that I don't, was never carrying around before. So that's where you might say, uh, I think that's a half dot, okay? So I'm, I'm carry, I do have to carry something else around, but it's something I, I'm carrying anyways. Um, so it's, it's not quite as bad. Um, then we can go into uh, security. Uh, so those are usability. So I won't go through all the security things, uh, but, but one thing uh, we can think about is, uh, can you guess it? Okay, uh, so uh, how easy is it to guess? Okay, now what we do in security is we generally distinguish between what we call an online attack and an offline attack. 
okay? An online attack is I go to facebook.com, I know your username, I put a guess in for your password. The website says, no, that's wrong, try again. I put another guess in, it says, no, that's wrong again, I try again. Uh, it says, no, you're wrong again. By the way, you're locked out now for an hour. So I get three guesses every hour, okay? So you can also think of that. So that's an online guess because I'm going through the user interface. Because I'm going through the user interface, they have a chance to slow me down artificially, okay? So sometimes we also call it throttled. So throttled is like when your car uh, has a, a limiter so it won't go over 150 kilometers an hour. That's called throttling, okay? Or your internet speed is slow because the you use too much bandwidth and so they're artificially slowing you down, okay? So sometimes password guessing attacks, you go through a throttled interface. And this is why the pin on your bank card can be only four digits. Because someone can go up to an ATM but they only get three shots and then it's locked, okay? They still have a good probability maybe of guessing your pin, but um, but but they, they don't get infinite chances. Uh, distinguish that from an offline attack. So let's say I have that database that's hashed, and now I want to guess passwords. So I'm going to hash them, and then I'm going to see if they match. That I can do as fast as I can do, okay? I can do as fast as my computer can do. I can get a bunch of computers and do it as fast as all those computers can do. No one's slowing me down. The website can't stop me or lock me out or anything like that, okay? So in that case, to, res to be resilient against that attack, I need more random passwords. I need stronger passwords, okay? If, if I'm protected by an online attack only, then my passwords don't have to be quite as strong uh, because I'm, I'm, able to, um, I'm able to artificially uh, limit things. Okay, so this goes into a, uh, oh, actually, let me just make sure I got all of this. Um, so online guessing, you go through the front end of the system, the website. Uh, if you're going it too fast or you're guessing too much, you'll either be throttled or locked out. And so secrets don't have to be strong. Uh, you can try and put numbers on it. Numbers don't really matter uh, so much. Like I, I, I won't ask an exam question about these numbers, but something like 64 bits or two to the 64 combinations, that would be like a reasonable threshold, I think, for an online guessing attack. So if you had more than 64 bits, I would say you're pretty safe in an online set setting. If you have less, though, I would be concerned even if it's an online attack. Even if I get 10 guesses, like your four-digit pin, I actually, that's not, um, that's not strong enough for, uh, for like an online attack, and I'll, I'll try and prove that to you in a sec. Um, the other way to think about it is where's this number coming from? Where's this password coming from, okay? And in my view, there's three main sources that you get a password from. One is you choose it, okay? If you choose it, it's probably going to be weak, okay? That's not you specifically and not every single password you have ever chosen, but across the population, if I just want to log into any one of you in this room, you all have an account at Concordia. I just need one of them. I don't care whose it is. Okay, the chances of at least one of you having a bad password, right? If, if you were able to choose it freely, Concordia will force you and use two-factor or whatever. But if you just were left to choose it freely, then there's a good probability that at least one of you would have a bad one and I could, I could break it, even if I was going through the website itself, okay? So we're gonna say that's not secure enough. On the flip side, the strongest is random numbers. So like the one-time pads and things like that that you get, uh, one-time passwords, uh, two-factor authentications, the RSA numbers, they're just pure random numbers, okay? Random numbers are great, they're hard to guess, everyone is equally likely as everything else, okay? And then the middle ground would be something like a biometric. So your fingerprint is kind of random, you didn't choose it, you didn't choose your fingerprint, okay? But it's not, you don't, I can't control the amount of randomness in my fingerprint, and if I measure it too sensitively, then the weather changes or I get cut on my finger or something like that and now it's not recognizing it, okay? So I have to parameterize like how accurate I want the scan to be. I, wanna, I want it to be detailed enough that I'm getting a bit of randomness, but it can't be so detailed enough that it's changing every day, okay? Um, so that, that's sort of like in the, the middle ground. So I would say that if it's human chosen, it's not going to resist either of these attacks. If it's a biometric, it will resist the first attack, but I wouldn't trust throwing a supercomputer hashing things, you know, to not be able to guess my fingerprint. 
Um, and if it's a truly random password and it's long enough, like something a password manager will give you, then it will resist both of these attacks. And so NIST says that uh, 2 to the 112 is, is sort of the, the current recommendation for how big something has to be so that you, you can feel safe that no one's going to guess it, even if it's a nation state that you know, is throwing all of their computing resources at trying to guess it. Okay, so in cryptography, we tend to choose things. Now, you, you're not going to memorize something that's 2 to the 112. Okay, it's too big to memorize. So at this point, if you're using something like that, it's either stored, well, it's stored, period. Okay, it's stored on your computer. It's either sitting in a file or it's sitting in a password manager wrapped with, with a password. Okay, now I want to take a slight detour and show you my favorite picture in all of computer science. And uh, I want to try and motivate why I think that human chosen secrets are very insecure, not just against offline attacks, but also against online attacks. Okay, so my favorite picture in all of computer science comes from uh, a paper. Uh, the paper's on the Moodle, uh, so if you want to read it, uh, you can. It's called a birthday present every 11 wallets, the security of customer chosen banking pins. And uh, this is the picture, okay? Now it doesn't make any sense to you yet, but I promise you by the end of this, you'll like this picture, okay? You might not think it's the best picture ever, but you'll at least, you'll, you'll like it a little bit. Okay, so the story behind this is, um, there was a password breach of a website. The website was called RockU. It's really old, okay? So like probably no one used it, maybe some people did, but it was kind of like a social networking thing, but it was music focused. Um, so that, that's the premise. And this website had zero password uh, properties. Like normally when you type a password in, it's like it has to be at least eight characters and you have to have a capital letter and a number and all that stuff, okay? This had none of that. If you want your password to be A, you could have your password be A. Okay, you just type A in, press enter, and that's it, okay? So people use all sorts of passwords. And one kind of password that people use a lot was a four digit pin, probably because they had it for their banking cards and stuff and they were familiar with it, okay? So what the researchers did is they went through the database and they just pulled out all the four digit pins and their question was simple, which was basically, okay, how random are the four digit pins that people choose? Okay, are they, uh, are they, yeah, are they random or are they, is there some patterns uh, to how people choose? Okay, and so to sort of see this graphically, what, they, what you're actually looking at is every four digit pin. It's represented by a little square. And uh, I'm gonna show you how to read a pin off it. And uh, you can see that the shade of blue is kind of light or dark. That basically is how popular it is, okay? So if there's a blue square and it's really dark, dark, dark blue, that means a lot of people are choosing that password. And if you see something that's white or like kind of off-white blue, uh, that means it's not very frequently chosen. And if it means anything to you, this is a logarithmic scale. So it amplifies, like the popular ones are really, really popular and, and the white ones are, are not so popular. Okay. Let's say that people choose four digit pins uniformly at random. Okay. What, and I was going to show you a picture of all the possible four digit pins and the shade of blue would be how popular they are. What would you expect to see? Most common number like eight, 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 zero, zero, one, two, three, four, and related to what they are kind of things. Okay. So that's the opposite. So I'm asking the opposite question. So let's say that that a machine is choosing these at random. So, so people aren't choosing them based on patterns. Uh, a machine's choosing them at random. Exact same color. Okay, I would expect to see the same color across the board. Every, everything is as likely as everything else. So if I look at a picture like this, I would see a light blue all over it, okay? Do we see a light blue everywhere? No, we see all these crazy zigzags and lines and things like that. Okay, so at the highest level, what that's telling me is that there are patterns to be seen, okay? So let's think about what some of those patterns are. So someone said one, two, three, four, okay? So let's use that as our first example. Um, so this is how you read the chart. So the first two digits of the pin, so the one, two in the one, two, three, four is along the x-axis. 
And then the second digits, the three, four, are along the white, uh, Y axis, okay? So if I wanna look up one, two, three, four, I look up one, two, so that would be this line here. And then I would find the three, four on the Y axis. And then where these two things meet, uh, that's, the, that's the pin one, two, three, four, okay? So what do I see at one, two, three, four? What color is that? Dark, dark, dark blue. So what does that mean again? Very common, okay? Maybe it might be the darkest blue square, one of them in the whole picture. So it's a very common kind of password, okay? Um, all right, let's look at some other patterns. Uh, let's look at uh, this right here. Actually, let's, we'll do it this way. Um, okay, so here you see that there's sort of, it's, it's not as obvious as some of the streaks and things like that. Uh, but you see something that to me looks kind of like a castle, like, uh, like there's like little lines here. There's definitely a pattern there, okay? So let's think about what this pattern is. So first off, you might not be able to notice it, but at zero, zero, uh, it doesn't actually exist. It actually just, the pattern starts at zero, one. And uh, so at zero, one, it goes up to 31, and then it stops. Then it goes to 30 and stops. Then it goes back to 31. Actually, no, it goes to 29, 28 and stops, my bad. Then it goes back to 31, then it goes to 30, then it goes to 31, 30, 31, 31, 30, 31, 30, 31. Any guesses? Okay, so what? where do you see a lot of 30s and 31s and every once in a while you see a 28 and a 29? How many days there are in a month in a Western calendar, okay? So what, what is zero, 01 up to 31? That's going to be the month, right? And it's going to be the date, okay? So there's a lot of people are picking pins that start with the zero, 01, but they only go up to 31. They don't like 32 for some reason, right? Because January only has 31 months, okay? So this shape here basically is the shape of the calendar, okay? So pretend you're an alien, you come to Earth, and the only thing you know about humankind is the passwords that they pick, right? You can read the Georgian calendar off of this chart uh, just by looking at the passwords they pick. Okay, so I think that's pretty cool. All right, so, and then notice that our friends in the US, you know, we tend to do date, or month, month, date, date. Actually, I don't know what we do. I've seen it both ways. But anyways, I know there's differences. Some countries do month, month, date, date. Some do date, date, month, month. And so you'll notice that this pattern here is exactly flipped. And it's down here as well. And so that's whether you start with the month and go to the day or you go from the day to the month. Okay, what's another like popular four digit number? So a birthday would be a month, month, day, day. Okay, how about year? Okay, so what, what would be a common, I mean, there's lots of years. There's the year 50. and something like that. Okay, so 19, blah, blah, 2000, blah, blah. Okay, so where would we find 19, blah, blah? All right, so we go along the axis, we find 19. So it's in this column. Okay, does this column look dark? So it starts to look dark, right? Starting around 1950, it gets more and more popular. 1965, 1980, 1995, it's getting really, really popular. And then for some reason it wraps, but it, then it starts at 20. 2000, 2005, 2010, and then it kind of dies out. I should tell you that this breach happened sometime in maybe around 2010, okay? Uh, so that's why it doesn't go up. But that's exactly what that is. So that dark streak is people choosing maybe the year they were born. Uh, that would explain why it gets sort of darker in, in recent times and maybe a little less dark as, as, as you get really, really recent. But it could be any other date that's meaningful uh, to them. Okay, what else can you think of? Any other kinds of patterns? Or just looking at the chart. So there's the diagonal. So what's that diagonal? Okay, okay. So if I want to do one 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 two 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 five 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 five, 
that's going to fall along a diagonal. And uh, and it could be like 4141. So that's not quite as popular. But you can see every now and then there's one that's like really dark. And so uh, they, they become the most popular is 6969. No idea why. <laughs> but, um, but anyways, so I call these like kind of mathy things. Um, so 444777. Four, four, seven. There's also things like uh, 2468, uh, 9876. Uh, so these are kind of less popular, but they're still dark, right? They're dark relative and on a logarithmic scale, this is a thing uh, that, that, that people are choosing. Then you can find other kinds of stuff. Um, so this was a music website, and so there are some uh, uh, albums, like older music, uh, like an older Usher album called 8701, so that was kind of popular. I was looking at this one because it's almost on the diagonal, but it's not quite. So it's 5150, I had to look this up, but there's the band, Van Halen has an album called that. It's a music site, so there's lots of music kind of people on it. Um, so you can see that. Um, this was also something I had to look up. Um, so. Back in the day, uh, you would have a phone and you could send text messages with the phone, but you didn't have a keyboard. Okay, so this was pre-keyboard. And so what would you do? Well, you would actually, all the numbers had letters assigned to them. So like the first letter one would be like A, B, C. You would press it one, two, or three times depending on which letter you want. And so if you want to spell out the word love, you would tap five, six, eight, three, and then that would spell it out. So that's uh, why that one is dark. Anyways, uh, you can look at this, the papers on the website. Uh, it's a fun exercise to just pick a random dark dot and try and figure out you know, why, why is it dark. And there's usually some reason behind it. You can at least Google that four digit number and you'll probably find an answer uh, for it. And so this is some of them, but not all of the things that, uh, that are in this. Okay, now what's the moral of the story? So the moral of the story is, I want to guess your back banking password pin, okay? Am I going to guess 0000, 0000, 0001, 0002, and go all the way up to 99999? Okay, what's a better strategy? Okay, so I'm going to look at a chart like this. If the square is dark, I'm going to guess it first. Okay, I'm going to sort these squares from darkest. So I'm probably going to guess 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm going to guess 1995. I'm going to guess 69, 69, whatever, okay? So these are the, the guesses I'm going to do. And this is how people guess passwords, okay? Passwords is not literally brute force. Brute force gives you that, that opinion of like, you start at 000, then you go to 001. That's not how people do it, okay? They use dictionaries outside of four digit pins. They know all the tricks that you play. Like you need to put a number in, so you're going to take the letter E and make it a three, or you're going to take an I and make it a one, or whatever, or you're going to add an explanation point on the end, right? They, they know it because they see it in all the passwords that have been leaked and dumped, okay? So they look at the pattern, then they take every word in a dictionary and they apply that pattern to it. So now you have two dictionaries worth of words, one with the pattern, one without, and then they do that with a million different pa patterns, and then they bundle it all up in software you download it, you press a button, and it's going to go through them in that kind of order. Or what you could do is, if I know something about you, like say you have a personal website, I can go scrape your personal website, build a dictionary based on the words I see, then I'm going to guess a lot of words or variations of the words that I'm seeing, okay? So, or I look at your social media profile or something like that, okay? So if you're using names of kids or where you were born or things like that, I have a higher probability of guessing it because I personalize the dictionary to your specific uh, data that you're showing me that's public anyways, all right? So this is how guessing works. So anything that's human chosen, you can't rely on, okay? Uh, you can't assume that human chosen is going to be good enough, even with all your like little rules about, you know, capital letters and numbers and, and at least eight digits and things like that. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, evaluation framework. Uh, another thing we can look at is can you sh shoulder surf? So for me, this was just a yes, no. Uh, so either it's resilient means it's not vulnerable uh, and nothing would mean that it's vulnerable. And then uh, physical theft is another one. Can I, is there something for me to steal? Does it let me log in if I actually steal it? So if 
I can't steal it. There's either nothing to steal or stealing it's not sufficient. So for example, I can steal your RSA token, right? But I can't log in with just your RSA token. I still need to know the password that you memorized, okay? So that would pass, that would be resilient to theft. Uh, deployability is another thing. Um, so this is, how much does it cost Concordia to roll out a system like this? Uh, so costs would be one. Um, so if, if it doesn't cost anything, then that's great. Uh, if it's, uh, sorry, I, this slide is wrong. Um, I'll correct it. Uh, th it's actually exactly wrong. Uh, so, so no new cost should get the full dot. Um, and then uh, if it's a cost per user, uh, it should be empty. And then you can also think like, maybe I put a server up, so that costs me something. But if I have 10 users or 10,000 users, it's the same cost for me. I just, I have to put the server up and then that's it, okay? So that's a little different than I have to buy an RSA token for all of you, okay? So I think of that as kind of a middle ground where there is a cost, but it's, <coughs> it's just a one-time cost and then each additional user is free. Okay, so then what we can do is we can start building our chart so it's, this is kind of boring and tedious, so I'll, I'll do it kind of fast, but you can spend more time with it. Um, also, this is like just, I'm sort of, like I say, I'm not doing this in a super lot of detail, okay? So this should be more or less right, um, but it, uh, you, you could disagree with, with these things or, or quibble a bit. And for your assignments, you'll, you'll do, you'll spend a little more thought on, on this. Uh, but anyways, okay, so easy to use, so physically effortless. Um, so I need to type something in or draw something every time I log in. So that's the worst. So passwords are like that, right? I have to put a password in every single time. Uh, with my RSA token, I'm always typing in both the password and the, the token thing. Two-factor, I'm still typing my password in, plus I have to copy this other thing. Uh, graphical password, every time I log in, I have to make the swipe pattern, okay? Can we reduce this? So can we do something where I don't have to do something every time. So let's go to the other extreme. So the only one that's really good are keys because it's stored on your computer, it's automated. Okay, so that's automatic. And then there's things like managers, oh sorry, and biometrics I also gave it. So you do have to put your finger on the fingerprint reader. So that's, this is where two different students will say a different thing. One will say, oh that, that is doing something. And another student will say, well, typing a 10 digit password and putting your finger on something don't feel like the same to me. Right, like putting your finger feels like a lot less effort than typing something out. Uh, and so anyway, there's room for, for disagreement. But I marked it as uh, you never have to type, draw, copy uh, to log in. And then single sign and password managers are the kind of thing where you do it once, it's unlocked, or there's a cookie or something that's stored, uh, you're now logged into Facebook and then you can you automatically log into all of your other websites. Or you might just click it and then it just redirects and, and checks it and, and everything's good, okay? Um, okay, uh, nothing to memorize. Uh, so again, let's just look at the extreme. So if you have a password for every website, you've got to memorize them all. Tokens and two-factor just add something in addition. You still have a password for every website, plus you have this extra thing. Uh, so they also are just like passwords. And graphical, you're changing how you're entering the password, but you're not changing the password itself, okay? Uh, this is like a, a, a world where websites, websites don't usually use graphical, it might be for your phone, but imagine every website had that swipe pattern. So you log into Facebook, you do it one way, you log into X, you do, it another, you do a different pattern or whatever. Um, similarly, password managers and single sign-on, uh, you just do it once. And then keys, you don't have to memorize, and biometrics, you don't have to memorize. Okay, now let's pause here. Look at U2 and U1, what, what, what do you see? They're the same, okay, I actually did this on purpose. Okay, if I'm doing this, I'm gonna now take a really hard look and ask myself, is U1 and U2 actually doing, the, are they telling you the same thing, right? So I go back to U1, it's, easy to enter a password, and this is like, I have to memorize a password, okay? So if I have it memorized, I have to enter it, 
right? So are they actually the same thing? Then I'll go through the mental exercise and say, okay, I'm not seeing a difference with these eight alternatives, but can I construct an alternative in my mind that would get U2 and not get U1, or vice versa, get U1 and not get U2, okay? Uh, so is it possible that I have to type something in, but I didn't have to memorize it? So it is possible, like maybe I have like passwords that are on a piece of paper in my wallet and I pull them out. Then I'm not gonna get U1, but I will get U2 because I didn't memorize them, okay? So to me, that's, I feel like they actually are different things. They're very similar, right? And as far as we can see, there's no difference to them, but you can come up with reasonable examples that would get one dot or, and, and not the other, okay? So I would vote to keep it. So I'd say, I'm gonna keep this. And then maybe in the paper, I would comment, even though they're coming out the same, you know, this is why I think they're actually different, okay? But if you see this, you need to go through that process yourself and really consider whether you should eliminate it as a column or, or decide if they're actually measuring the same thing. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, do we have to carry something? So for almost all of them, you don't have to carry anything. Uh, the two exceptions are uh, your RSA token, you have to carry something new so it doesn't get the dot. And then two-factor, if it's SMS specifically, there's different ways of doing two-factor. But for SMS, I have to carry my phone. I'm already carrying my phone, but I still have to carry it. So that to me is kind of a half dot. Okay, I do have to carry it. If I forget it, I can't log in. Uh, but it's not as bad as the RSA token in my mind. S1, S2 are, uh, does it resist uh, offline, online, or both. Um, and so anything that involves a random number that's selected by a computer, I just gave two dots. So your RSA token gives you a random number. It, it's complemented with a user chosen password, okay? But the security, the resilient from guessing is coming from that second factor, which is truly random. Um, a a two-factor, uh, you get a random number over SMS. And then your cryptographic keys are, are really random. Okay, those are all chosen um, by a computer. The one thing I gave one and not the other was biometrics. It's kind of in the middle. It's not a human chosen thing. But from my reading of the literature, the entropy in your fingerprint is nowhere near what it would be in a cryptographic key. Okay, so it's kind of in the middle. And then passwords, uh, a, pa a manager with a master password uh, single sign-on uh, where you have at least one password with Facebook and a graphical password are all user chosen. Uh, so I chose them. Even graphical passwords, people, you could do that same kind of study that we saw with graphics and you'll see there's hot points or certain patterns that people like and things like that. So there is, it's not like every pattern is as equally likely as every other pattern. Uh, Shoulder surfing, I just picked this one because it was kind of fun. You might think that like nothing solves shoulder surfing, right? I watch you type your password in. Let's say I have a high res video camera on your keyboard at all times. Don't I always get your password? And the answer is no, there are a couple scenarios where you wouldn't. For example, if you use your fingerprint, then it doesn't matter. You can take a video of me putting my finger on my phone and it, you're not gonna get my password. Um, Password manager, now that I'm sitting here staring at it, I don't know why I gave it a full dot. Um, and I also see I have a half dot for single sign-on. So anyways, I think this is a bug in the slide. Um, let's, let's go to keys first. So keys is something on my computer. It just happens automatically. So there's nothing to see me type in. Uh, the half dot, which I didn't define, I would say is like, I have to type one password in once. You could shoulder surf that. But if I can get that one password into the system, then all my other passwords will automatically get filled in and then shoulder surfing is not going to help you. So I would, I would edit the slide to give manager a half dot and single sign a half dot because the master password could be shoulder surfed. But once those are in the system, then everything else is automatic and there's nothing to see. Uh, physical theft. Um, so Biometrics, well, let's go to keys. So the big problem with keys, keys actually look good. Look at, look at it at, on a row-based perspective. You want the most dots? Look at keys, right? Keys look awesome. They have almost all the dots except for one. So what's the dot they're not getting? Well, I just steal your computer, I have your key. 
right? I pick up your laptop, I walk out, I have your key, I can log in as you, okay? So that's a pretty serious like security deficit. It's probably enough of a security deficit that we, uh, that's why you don't see keys. They're not that common, right? If you believe this chart, you would think that this is probably what most people use and maybe there's some reasons to use some of the other things. Right? Now, now notice I'm not, I don't have every security property, every usability property, every deployability property. Okay, but, it, but anyways, that's an example where it's resilient. It's not resilient to physical theft or it's vulnerable. Another is biometrics. So I can seal your fingerprint. I can seal your finger, right? That's a little morbid, um, but I, easier I can seal your fingerprint, pick up a glass. You've seen it on CSI or whatever, and, but it's real. And then I can 3D print a rubber finger uh, and it has your fingerprint on it. And then I can spray it with something that makes it conductive uh, so that, that your fingerprint reader can send a current through it and figure out where the ridges are on it. Okay, done. Um, so theft is possible. It's physical theft because I need physical access to you or something you touched uh, in order to do it. I can't do it from across the world. With malware, I could. Um, so it, it's a physical thing, but, but anyways. Um, and then deployability, we can think about costs. So most, most things are, are basically free. Um, single sign-on, Facebook has to throw up a server, right, that's gonna handle all this extra traffic of people checking their passwords. Uh, so there's a one-time cost. But once the server is running, you know, obviously there's a difference between 10 users and a million users, but it's not, it's not like they're paying a certain amount for every extra user. Um, Tokens, you have to buy a token and give it to everyone. Okay, so it's going to do bad on costs. And then biometrics are free, like your fingerprint's free, right? The problem with biometrics is the flip side, which is the reader, right? So if I want everyone to use biometrics to log into my Concordia, uh, I have to also give you a fingerprint reader. Okay, so that's what I'm giving you, or I'm giving you an iris scanner. You could argue the camera for facial recognition is something you already have on your laptop or your phone or something like that. Uh, but, but anyways, you, you have to make decisions about whether you give dots or not. So I didn't give it the dot because normally a biometric requires a reader and the reader is not free and you have to give it to every user. Okay, so again, there's more than one way of doing it. There's the dots, you might come up with things that are slightly different. The columns you might come up with are slightly different. But I would expect across the classroom that, that like 80% of kind of the stuff you're telling me is going to match. And the overall pictures of like, this looks a little bit better than this, or this is good on usability, but bad on security and vice versa. Those kinds of like big picture messaging should be more or less consistent across, across the class, okay? So everyone will come up with slightly different frameworks, but the, the, they won't be like completely different or, or sort of you know, say completely different things uh, when you look at them. Okay, now next question. Which one's the best? Okay, so I like that answer. So it depends. So there, there, there's no, there's none that you can say is actually strictly better than all of the others, right? For everyone that has a dot somewhere, it's missing a dot somewhere else. Okay, so the only thing you can say about it is tell me which dots you care about the most. Obviously, you want a system that has a full dot all the way across. It doesn't exist. There's probably some trade off that's like really fundamental. Like as soon as you do this, you can't get this other dot. Right. Or maybe people aren't smart enough. I don't know what it is. I can tell you we've had passwords for 50 years and this is the best that we've come up with. Okay, so probably not there's probably not a future technology that's going to get the dots all the way across. Um, so then pick what you want. Well, they're all going to have some deficit. They're either going to cost some money or they're not going to be secure against certain kind of attacks or they're not going to be as usable. Um, you know, they all have poison somewhere in them and you just got to choose the one that, that, that you want to choose. Okay. Um, so that's what an evaluation framework is good at. It's good at presenting alternatives where there's no clear winner. If there's a clear winner, you might not need this. You could just, I could just try and argue with you that it's the clear winner. But in this case, I'm not actually trying to convince you that you should use biometrics. That's not my goal. My goal is to just give you a neutral level playing field evaluation of all of them, 
let you decide. Okay, so I'm passing the decision on you, onto you, but I'm just showing you everything that I know about them. Okay, now as mentioned, this is kind of a toy example. You know, I kept things very simple. Um, so let's say you were to do an academic paper. Uh, so you can look at this paper and you can be impressed by how long it is and, uh, and they really go into detail about every little thing and eventually they go basically system by system, dot by dot saying I gave a dot, a full dot here because of this reason I gave a half dot here. So it's one thing I want from you in your assignment. Okay, so pay attention, this is important. I want, if I, I let, let me go back to the simple one. If I see that you gave keys a full dot on S2, okay, I might not agree with it. That's fine. That's part of the art and not science. I might not agree with your decision, okay? So that's, you're not going to lose marks because I don't agree with it, okay? But there needs to be a sentence somewhere that says why you did that. Why did I give S2 keys a full dot? And it should match your definition of what it means to get a full dot on S2, okay? You can do it really quickly. You can do it, you can bundle things together and say, you know, for passwords biometrics, they're all the same. So I gave all of them a full dot for this reason. But somewhere in your report, there needs to be a reason. So if I want to know why something got what it got, it needs to be said somewhere, okay? And, it, and not just repeating, I gave it a full dot. That's just telling you what, that's telling me what you did, which I can already see because I can see your chart. But the why, what's the reason, okay? Reason doesn't have to be super complicated. It doesn't have to be a deep dive. Just a sentence is fine, but that reason has to be there somewhere, okay? So it's a little tedious, right? Because you have eight systems, you have eight properties, so you have 64 dots to explain. So 64 sentences, right? So it, it's, it's kind of boring to write and it's boring to read. We usually shovel all these details into an appendix of a paper, uh, but, but you gotta do it, okay? Especially for an assignment, uh, you have to say why everything got a dot. Now the, the framework I'll make you do will be a lot smaller. I'll go through it next class, uh, what, what you'll actually do in the assignment. But anyways, these people do a, a, a really uh, detailed job of, of every single dot. Oops, wrong paper. And anyway, so you can see that uh, this is like a full-fledged effort. So you can see that their usability properties, I know it's sideways, um, but you can see that they have uh, a lot more than we looked at. Uh, they have a bunch of deployability. Uh, they have a lot of security, uh, different properties, including stuff that we didn't look at. Uh, and then in terms of systems, um, so again, they, they do sort of an example um, and then they, I, I kind of said, don't do brands. This kind of contradicts it because it looks like they're doing brands. But the reason the, these brands are more like an example. So they're, they're not actually evaluating Firefox specifically. They're picking Firefox as an example of a password manager that does not have a master password. I think that was the distinction uh, as opposed to LastPass, which does. Or it might have been that Firefox was a local file on your computer and LastPass was synced across them. I, f I forget what the distinction is. It will be in the paper somewhere. Um, but anyways, you can see, so password managers we looked at. Federated is what they call single, what we call single sign-on. Uh, so Facebook Connect, uh, that kind of thing. Graphical, we talked about. They have some specific schemes that are not the Android swipe pattern, but the same idea. Um, hardware token, so like an RSA token uh, is here. Uh, one-time password over SMS is basically two-factor authentication or Google two-step is two-factor authentication. They look at biometrics, fingerprint, iris voice. Uh, then they do some recovery stuff. Uh, they have a whole bunch of other protocols that are more obscure. Um, so there's other hardware-based things and phone-based things. Um, there's some like physical stuff, like things you get on paper or like visualizations. So these are some examples that we didn't do because they're not well known. Um, and then there's even some cognitive ones where the website gives you a challenge and then you have to like do something in your brain, like a brain teaser and then like give the answer and it's based on your password and that's how they authenticate you. Um, but anyways, uh, you obviously don't have to know any, anything about any of the things that we didn't talk about in class, not going to ask about it. But if you are interested in what an evaluation framework looks like, 
Uh, you should be at, le at least a little bit interested because of your assignment, but there's also a chance that you do a project where maybe you do something like this for your project. That's fine. A chart like this is, is a project, right? Um, and, and lots of year, every year, lots of students do something like this, okay? Um, it doesn't even have to be as complicated as this, uh, uh, but, you know, I, I, do accept, I do expect a degree of complexity that's greater than your assignment and greater than what we did in class. What we did in class took an hour. What you do in your assignment might take you two, three hours. I don't know. Maybe it only takes you an hour. Uh, this probably took them months and months and months. Uh, so something in between is, is fine. Um, the other thing they do is they have green and red. So the, the base system, the incumbent system, is just the normal passwords, right? So what green means is you actually did something better than normal passwords, and red means that you did something worse uh, than normal passwords. And so uh, if you're wondering what the color means, but you don't have to do that. You won't do that for the assignment, but you can play around with like the symbols and have more than two dots and, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing it. Okay, now what was their conclusion? So they, they did this whole thing. Um, so I'll just read you one quote from the paper. Uh, not only does no known scheme come close to providing all desired benefits, in other words, nothing comes close to getting a full dot all the way across, um, none even retains the full set of benefits that legacy passwords already provide. Okay, so none of them are really, not, you can't say any one of these is better than passwords. In other words, it gets some dots that passwords don't, but it doesn't lose dots that passwords already have. Okay. Uh, in particular, there's a wide range uh, from schemes offering minor security benefits beyond legacy passwords to those offering significant security benefits, but the trade-off being in return to being either more costly to deploy or more difficult to use. So in other words, if you sort of study them, you realize that if you want something that's more secure than passwords, it's probably going to become less usable or it's going to cost you more money. Okay? That seems to be the general trade-off. And this is a pattern you can observe because you sweat the details and did this whole chart. Otherwise, you, can, you, you might think those things, but you can't really back it up. But if I show you the whole chart and you can see these kind of patterns uh, for yourself. Okay? So this is the reason why uh, there's no consensus. You know, Concordia uses two-factor now. Lots of websites you use, use normal passwords. Lots of things on your phone use single sign-on. Uh, when you use SSH, you're using keys. Uh, and, and it's not like everyone's using the same system. It's still that way. It's going to be that way for the next 20, 30 years because there is no even theoretical system that, that solves all the problems that you want to have solved. Okay? So that's, anyways, the evaluation framework. It's not maybe the only methodology that would let you conclude that, but it's a really good one uh, that, that showcases that. Okay, questions about this or the evaluation framework? Or about anything that we talked about? Yeah. Uh, so if the single sign-on, if, if we consider that, yep. um, if we have to sign on only once, right? Uh, I, I have some confusion as to why we did it half Sure. So uh, we can go back to the chart, but um, I'll just, let me explain my vision of it. So single sign-on could work differently. So there are different uh, uh, variants of it that might work differently. But when I put the dots in, this is what I was picturing in my mind. So I go to some website and uh, it says, okay, put in your username, password, or you can connect through Apple, let's say. So I say, well, I, I logged in through Apple when I created the account. So then I'll click on Apple. Now, if I haven't logged in yet to Apple, then Apple is going to say, what's your username and password? Then I'll put it in. But if I have logged into Apple, then it's going to redirect me to Apple. Apple will have something called a cookie that's set. So that's how it knows I'm logged in. We'll talk about cookies at the end of the class, um, at the end of the course. And then uh, it will just redirect me back, and now I'll be logged in automatically. So I, I might see some flickering, like going to the other website. I may, might even have to click like a consent or like authorize or something like that, but I don't have to actually put my password in. Yeah, and so that's, that's the difference there. Yeah. So uh, in my mind, it's, it's very similar to a password manager because you also, 
you usually unlock it. It might be with your operating system. So once you log into the operating system, then you, you also unlock your password manager at the same time. But if you're using like LastPass or something that's not in your operating system, uh, then you might have to explicitly type a password in to unlock it. Then once it's unlocked, then it will automatically populate your passwords for you. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the benefit of a password manager is the websites don't have to change, right? They, they should at least have like a password field that it, from HTML inspection looks like a password field. Then your password manager will know to put something there. But, um, but the website doesn't have to do anything special. Like it doesn't even know I'm using a password manager. It has no idea. It sees me type a password in, it doesn't know what's coming from a manager instead of me. But with single sign-on, every website has to change. They have to bring in Apple, Facebook, whatever, you know, that login capabilities. So from a deployability standpoint, single sign-on is a lot more work than a password manager. And then you also have the privacy concern of, of them getting pinged every time. Yeah. Which you may have with a password manager too, depending on how it works. Uh, so maybe the password manager also logs every time you, you use a password. Other questions or comments or anything you want to say? I just have to ask one question. Yep. Uh, why, why in banking, the mobile banking and stuff, uh, they, uh, they don't uh, right now uh, choose the six digit, uh, you know, passcode? Because I guess that it's going to be more um, unpredictable, and then uh, it's bit, it, it it should be changed somehow in, in right. this uh, you know new decade. Uh, for for I guess uh, since three years ago, it, it, they they would have changed this because iPhone did this actually on the mobile, yeah. But uh, in card and everything, it's, it's still on four digits. Right. So why 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 uh, don't they do this? Like, yeah. So banks. So banks sometimes have six and four. I've seen it both ways. Uh, but uh, th th the main reason is that, that you're forced actually into an online attack. So like you can't, I guess if I got your card and I had like some sort of reader or something like that, maybe I could try and brute force your password based on what I was seeing on the circuit. Um, but the, uh, the main way to guess it would be to put the card into an ATM and then guess through the ATM and the bank's going to stop me. They're going to lock me out after a couple guesses. I don't know what the number is. But, um, and so that's why uh, even with, well, anyways, we can argue about the security and things. I think 10 passwords is a lot. If, if you have a four-digit pin and I get 10 cracks at it, especially if I steal everyone's debit card and I don't care, I just want to log into one, I'll try one, two, three, four on all of your cards. Then I'm going to try 19, I'm going to try 2003 on all of your cards. And, you know, within 10 things, I, there is a good chance that I'll get one of, one of yours kind of thing. Um, so, so anyways, the other thing about banking is uh, you go to an ATM, there's a camera. You're on camera going in, right? You're leaving your fingerprint on the pad. Like police could come and physically investigate it. Uh, um, yeah, so, so, so there, there's a whole bunch of additional kind of thing. I need to physically steal it off of you. Um, and so when banks think about security, they think in holistic terms, right? They don't just think about, like, should it be four digits or six? They're thinking about, you know, I have to steal your card. I have to go to an ATM. We have surveillance on the ATMs. We're going to lock you out of, after 10 things. If you're able to do it, what are you going to do? You're going to withdraw cash. Well, we're going to give the money back to the customer because they're going to report it as stolen, right? And we are going to have surveillance of you taking the cash out. Maybe we have the, like, the bill numbers, and then if it shows up later, we'll, we'll try and backtrace it or whatever. Or you send it to another account, then we're going to reverse it and trace it and things like that. So banks, yeah, they, they, they think about security in, in, in all terms, not just like little problems like that. So four digits is enough. Yeah. So four digits, in their calculation, um, the amount of customers they're not losing because they're forcing them to use six digits is making them more money than the amount of money they have to pay to people who got their bank cards stolen and someone guessed their password. Yeah, so for them it's just, it's really just a numbers kind of game. They're trying to keep their customers happy. They're trying to outcompete the other banks. At the same time, they're trying to do the secure thing because it loses them money, right? But both of the things lose money. They, they bump up security, it loses them money through customers. 
they lower security, it loses the money through fraud, right? And so they just, they try and pick a, a sweet spot in between. Okay, other, yeah, yes. questions, yeah. Could I consider each column like a uh, percentage of importance? Let's say for me it's twice important that it's cheaper than it is secure. So I put two dots in that column, yeah. so I consider it twice. Okay, okay, good question. So also you could just add up the dots, like, like something that gets five dots, is that better than something that gets three dots? Or do you wanna weight them? So my, you can do whatever you want. But my message with an evaluation framework would be let the reader decide. So I give you it in the neutral format, which is I don't weight what's worth what. You can take my chart and you can say, I really care about U3. And then you can add two dots to U3 or whatever. Like that's up to you. And if I give it to someone else in the class, they'll have a different perspective. So I wouldn't try and do that in the framework itself because you're trying to just be as neutral as possible, but you can tell the person you're giving it to them that they, they're free to do that or even suggest it, and then that will help them make a decision with your chart. Yeah, so I wouldn't build it into the chart itself, but it's something that someone can do when they look at your chart. Yeah. Other questions, comments, concerns? Okay, we'll see you next week.